The text that we read a few moments ago said he saved others, himself he cannot save. Oh, they could admit it now. They could admit that he had saved others. But now the victory is theirs. He cannot save himself. Out on a little hill, not very far from Jerusalem, Jesus of Nazareth, the young prophet preacher, was nailed to a cross and hung between two thieves. His enemies were there, those who were responsible for his death. And their eyes were filled with hatred. His friends were there, but their eyes were filled with tears. Today, I want us to think about the cross. We've been singing all morning about the cross. We've been remembering the cross in the Supper of the Lord. Let's think further about the cross. And I'm calling my message today, Paradoxes at the Cross. A paradox is made up of two statements that seem that they contradict. But in fact, both statements are true. I want us to begin by thinking for a moment about the way to the cross. That journey from the king's pa- from the governor's palace to the hill of Calvary. That procession set out with, no doubt, a Roman centurion, maybe on a white horse, leading a group of soldiers. Maybe they were in two lines following him. It's morning. And against their helmets and their spears and their vests, the morning sun might have flashed back. But if we'd been there that day, our eyes would have fallen upon those between those rows of soldiers. There were three of them. They were carrying crosses, and we would have known that upon those crosses they soon would die. But most of all, we would have seen the one with that hideous crown on his head, a crown of thorns, thorns that no doubt pierced his brow so that The blood ran down. And we would have noticed his garment that was soaked in the back by his blood because of the Roman scourging that he had received the night before. And it looked like he was ready to collapse. So much so that a man from the crowd that was watching was summoned to bear the cross for him. Simon of Cyrene had traveled about 500 miles across the Mediterranean Sea to come to Jerusalem to worship. He didn't know he was going to witness the death of a sinless man. 
much less that he would be compelled to bear the cross after Jesus. Crowds lined the streets. And in that crowd, there were the women. The women who had faithfully followed him from Galilee. They were weeping. And he turned to them and he said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and weep for your children. And he said that because of the calamity that was to one day soon come upon all of them. Mark tells us that they brought him to a place called Calvary or Golgotha. And the word that Mark uses means, among other things, that they might have carried him. He wasn't able to bear his cross. He had endured so much suffering. And they brought him to that hill and nailed him to a cross. I wanted to emphasize the procession in order that we might view in our mind's eye the events. I wanted to talk about the people, the people who were involved, those who lined the streets, those who nailed him to the cross, those who were crucified with him, and those who cursed him as he died. They said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he's the son of God, let him come down from the cross. He who said, destroy the temple and I will rebuild it in three days. He who claimed that God was his father. Let him come down and we will believe. And even the robbers who died with him railed upon him. And one of them said, if you're who you claim to be, save yourself and us. And he would not stop until the other thief said, we deserve to be here but he has done nothing wrong. And then he said, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus replied, today you will be with me in paradise. As Jesus looked down from the cross and there was the jeering of his enemies and the weeping of his friends, Maybe only a few heard him when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And hanging in agony upon his cross, he saw in the crowd his own mother. And he thought of others more than himself. And he said to her, John will take care of you. My friend and my disciple, he will see that you have what you need. Woman, behold your son. And John, this is your mother. If there was a dark cloud coming down from the mountain, it was high noon, but the cloud blotted out the sun and it was darker than any day had been. And out of the darkness, Jesus cried, I thirst, demonstrating his humanity. And they brought him a sponge filled with vinegar on the end of a stick and 
put it to his mouth, but he would have nothing to do with that sedative. He would be fully conscious as he suffered, bled, died. And in the darkness and in the suffering, he cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And finally, he said, It is finished. And Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he died. There was a centurion there. And as he saw all the events surrounding the death of Jesus, he said, truly, this was the Son of God. Notice the place, the place where he died. Called the place of the skull because it is believed that the little hill itself resembled a human skull with caves in the side of it for eyes and nose and mouth. But it was a place of execution. And as the place of execution, it was a place easily seen by passers-by. But it was a lonely place for he died there alone. Oh, there were people around, but he died alone. It was a shameful place because he died between two thieves as though he were the vilest of the three. He bowed his head, gave up his spirit. Now there are a number of paradoxes about the cross of Christ. Remember two statements that seem to contradict, but both are true. And I want us, first of all, to gaze upon the one who is hanging upon the cross and see those paradoxes. The first is in the words of the religious leaders. He saved others. Himself, he cannot save. Now, they were right, you know. Oh, they were not right that he could not save himself. He could have. Did he not say, I could pray my father and he presently would send 12 legions of angels to deliver him? Oh, he could have saved himself. But had he saved himself, he could not have saved us. The acorn cannot save itself if it is to become a mighty oak. The soldier cannot save himself if he will save his country. And the shepherd cannot save himself if he will save the sheep. Jesus saved others. He opened the eyes of the blind. He open deaf ears, he caused dumb tongues to be loosed, he healed the cripple, he healed the withered hand, he even raised the dead that you might believe. And he said more than once, your sins are forgiven. Oh, he saved others. But if he's to save you and me, he could not save himself. It's the paradox of the cross. Additionally, it may be noted that he is humiliated. Death by crucifixion was 
the most humiliating that man had devised. But although he was humiliated, we know that he was exalted. In Philippians chapter 2, after the apostle Paul had said that he was the very he had this very nature of God, but he did not hold to that place in heaven with the Father. But he emptied himself and he came into the world and was made as a man. He was the perfect combination of humanity and divinity. He was always divine and always will be divine. For a little while, he became a man, divine and human. And Paul affirms that as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. But Paul is not finished. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Humiliated and exalted, paradox of the cross. Number three, he was defeated. He was defeated but victorious. In his death, all of hell must rejoice because their enemy is gone, but Satan did not reckon that there would be a Sunday. When he was raised from the dead, after showing himself alive to his disciples for a few days, he was taken up into heaven and glorified at the right hand of God. He was defeated and yet victorious. The paradox of the cross. But next he was forsaken and yet accepted. It was not delusion that caused him to cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken by God, for God can have nothing to do with sin. His son is the sin bearer, and in that hour God turned from him so that he could save the world. Forsaken yet accepted. For God raised him from the dead and allowed him to enter the glories of heaven. It's a paradox of the cross. But number five, he was innocent and yet became sin for us. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, the Bible says, He was made to be sin for us who knew no sin. Now mark it well, that does not say he became a sinner. He never did anything wrong, and he never did anything that disappointed the Father. Had he broken the Father's heart, he never would have been qualified to be the Savior of the world. That takes a perfect sacrifice. but he took the place of sinners. He was reckoned as a sinner. And he bore the sin of the world. Paul affirms he became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The paradox of the cross. And then number six, he was human and yet divine. How can that be? 
It's by the miracle of what we call the incarnation, God becoming man. Portrayed in the New Testament through a birth of a virgin, God took on human form. And this one who is crucified was a man. But he was also divine. You understand what I'm saying? There are paradoxes surrounding the cross. And upon the cross, we see at least six of those. Now, look beneath the cross. Beneath the cross, there is poor, lost humanity. Held in the slimy coil of the serpent of sin, and unable to release himself by himself. God must act on his behalf. And God did act. And in God's activity, we see beneath the cross paradoxes with us. Notice first that we are lost. We are the lost of the earth, and yet we are the found. One time Jesus told three stories about that which was lost and that which was found. He said there was a shepherd that had a hundred sheep, and one of them was lost in the wilderness, and the shepherd left the ninety-nine to go search for the one that was lost. He said there was a woman who had ten coins and she lost one of them and she swept her house carefully until she found the one that was lost. And then there was the well-known father who had two sons and one of them rebelled against him and left home and wasted his life and his wealth in riotous living. The father must have looked every day down the lane to see if his boy was coming home. But as the sun set, as the sun set each night, the boy wasn't coming. But in Jesus' story, he said, the young man came to himself. Nobody can ever come to God till they come to themselves, which says that people who understand that they're lost in sin and choose to remain in sin, there's something wrong. They're not at themselves. Somehow we haven't grasped the tragedy of sin or of being lost. And the young man came to himself, and by his choice he got up, and he went home. The father saw him coming. He didn't even wait for him to get there. He ran to meet him. When you choose to come to God, he'll run to meet you. He fell on his neck and kissed him. Restored him to his sonship. The lost became the found. Now, who is it that God wants to be saved? Peter said in 2 Peter 3, 9, now get it. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How many does God want to be saved? Everybody. Well, why aren't they saved? Is it because God is picking and choosing arbitrarily? you to life and you to death, and it doesn't matter what you want, it's settled in eternity. Did not Jesus say, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest? How cruel if he calls and I can't come. What would you think of me if I took a little child and tied him to a chair and went across the room and said, I have candy here, and if you will come, I'll give it to you, and he can't come. God says, come, and if I can't come, how cruel. 
The Bible says, whoever wills, whoever wants to, let him come and take of the water of life freely. Lost, yet found. Number two, a paradox at the cross for you and me is that we are humble, but we are to be exalted. It takes humility to come to Christ. We have to see that we are insufficient of ourselves, that we're dependent upon another. And as the oxen must bow its head to get under the yoke, if you're going to serve under the yoke of Christ, you'll have to become humble. And yet in 1 Peter 5, 5 through 7, Peter said, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due season. We're humble, but we're exalted. But next, we die and yet we're alive. Now, when we were in our sin, we were dead in that we had no relationship with God. Sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says that. And all of sin says Romans 3 and verse 23. So everybody at some point in their life has been separated from God. And he will remain separated from God until proper choices are made. That separation is spiritual death. That's the basic meaning of death, separation. When the man's spirit and body are separated, we say he's dead. When man is separated from God, he's dead in sin. And we were in death. But Jesus has given us life. And we choose to die to ourselves so we can live to him. The paradox of the cross is that we die, yet we live. But next, we, we lose so we can gain. Jesus said, he who loses his life will gain it, and he who gains his life will lose. What's he mean by that? He means that we can live our lives for ourselves and we'll miss out on what really is life, but we can surrender our lives to him and live forever, abundantly here and eternally over there. We lose and yet we gain. Number six, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. The cross changed all of that. This world is not our homes. We do not belong to this culture. We belong to another home. And it is a home to which we're going. It's the paradox of the cross for us. And last, we are weak yet we've become strong. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talked of all of his adversity. And he said that his adversity kept him humble so that he would not be exalted higher than in his own mind than he should. But he said out of his infirmities, he was weak. And yet God used all of that to make him strong let me tell you something today. When we are in Christ, we are strong. The body will waste away and will decay. But our spirits will live. For in weakness, we are made strong. Now let me close this morning by asking some questions. The paradoxes of the cross are all made possible 
because God so loved the world. We've been singing this morning about the love of God for us. <clears throat> Don't you think that because of what God has done for us, that we ought to give our lives to Him? Because He's loved us, shouldn't we love Him back? And when he says, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, don't you think we ought to do that? Rather than delaying or arguing over whether it's necessary or not. Don't you think we ought to do that? I want to tell you something I hope you'll take with you this morning if you forget all else. If you give... Him first place in your life. He will give you first place. If you give Him second place, He will give you no place at all. For He knows no rival. So what would it take for you today to give first place to Him in obedience to the gospel and in living for righteousness and truth, what would that take? And whatever the answer is, I hope you'll do that. You may make a commitment from where you are. You may want to make a public response this morning to obey the gospel or to renew a covenant with God. But let us all respond.